Hello, and welcome to the final webinar of the webinar series, uh, webinar number 17, E-Archiving Geospatial Records Approaches and Benefits. It is great to have you all here with us today on this rare and beautiful morning in Brussels. Uh, my name is Pavel Stech, and I'm the onboarding manager for, e for the E-Archiving Building Block. Well, some housekeeping rules for the novices of the webinar series. This is a two hour webinar, and so the speakers will go af uh, one after the other. If you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to use the uh, chat function on the right hand side of your screen. We do have a team that will monitor um, all questions that are posted there, questions and comments. One other final note, we do have a satisfaction survey that will be posted uh, right after uh, Dr. Jamie Kaminsky's uh, speaking uh, section. Uh, and without further ado, we will go to the uh, agenda. As I said before, my name is Pavel Stech. I will be the opener. I'm from the CEF uh, Stakeholder Management Office in DG Digit. After me, we will have uh, Dr. Jamie Kaminsky from the e-archiving building block, who is the training lead. Uh, he will uh, do a short welcome. Uh, for for the final time uh, for the e-archiving building block. Next, we will have uh, Gregor uh, Zaznik from uh, GeoArc, and he will uh, talk on the topic of e-archiving ge geospatial records, how to benefit from SITS geospatial. Finally, we'll have Anne Kristen Egland from the Danish National Ar Archives, uh, talking about the impressions from early adopters. Uh, as I said previously, there is a question and answer sec uh, section, which we will go through all the questions posted in the chat uh, that I talked about earlier. Without further ado, uh, a quick welcome uh, uh, for our regular listeners. We always start these webinars with a quick overview of the building blocks funded from the CEF uh, program. But is it you? As, but as you may know, this program does conclude this year, and we are waiting for the uh, conclusion of the discussions to launch the digital decade. So the first work program for the digital Euro program can be published at any moment. And when I mean any moment, I mean it could be published uh, while this webinar is even going on. Uh, we are waiting for the how and where the building blocks will fit in this program, and we will let you know as soon as uh, more information does become available. Um, any and all relevant specifications, sample software, and relevant stakeholders of the building blocks seen here on the screen can be found on the website, uh, also featured here, that you will that will bring you to the CEF digital platform. I will not go into the building blocks all individually, but if you do have any interest in any or all of them, please go to the CEF digital website that you can see on the bottom of your screen. This is a fantastic resource, and a lot of the time uh, was spent to make sure that it is as accessible and easy to use as possible. As we go on to the next slide, this is just some basic rules and approaches to know if you do find a building block that matches your interest or your organization's requirements. Each building block has a team of people that are ready to co-develop solutions and partner with you to help you figure out uh, what your needs are, whether it be to build a solution from scratch based on a European standard, uh, European standard, or to buy a compliance solution from the market with standards being marketized and adopted by market players, or you can reuse sample software provided from the same Ceph Digital website provided in the previous slide. The key message is that the building blocks are indeed under, underpinned by the European and or international standards linked to large uh, member state initiatives or uh, European legislation. And now with that quick introduction out of the way, I do pass the floor to Dr. Jamie Kaminsky, the training lead. Thank you, Pavel. That was uh, fantastic as always. So as Pavel mentioned, um, I'm the head of training at the uh, e-archiving building block. Um, so welcome everybody to what is the 17th and last webinar of the season. Um, so today we're going to be looking, as we said, at e-archiving geospatial records. And to do this, we have anne Kristin Egeland from the Danish National Archives and Gregor Svarsnik from uh, GeoArc. So 
As regular listeners know, I usually say a few words of introduction, but as Pavel said, we will keep it very brief today because most of you know this already. Um, next slide, please. So as many of you know by now, the aim of the building blocks is to provide specifications, software, training, um, and knowledge to help people preserve and reuse digital information over the long term. Now, all of this information is available on the building block website, which you can see um, on screen here. Um, and so that's all I'm going to say on this. Uh, we will provide a link to the website uh, in the chat box after this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what we do, um, well, we provide a variety of e-archiving services. So, for example, we maintain technical specifications. Um, we also provide open source tools that you can download and use straight away. Um, we have validation services that ensure that the specifications are followed correctly. Um, we've got a service desk, and again, we'll provide a, a link later. Um, also, we've got uh, outreach and community engagement activities, of which this is one, and obviously the training offering, um, which this is also part. Uh, next slide, please. So as Pavel mentioned earlier, the webinars will be recorded. Um, they're made available um, on the e-archiving webinar web pages, which you can see an example of here. Um, so on these pages, you'll have access to the PDF. Um, of the slide deck, the recording of the webinar itself. And also you can see, for example, in the far right-hand corner here, um, the anonymized questions and answers um, that have been uh, asked at the webinars. So if you ask a question today, um, it'll be anonymized, transcribed and made available for the community. So that's really helpful. Next slide, please. You can also find the webinar recordings directly on the Ceph YouTube channel. Now, I say this every time we have one of these webinars. Do have a look at this channel. It is great. Um, we've got videos there from all of the building blocks, not just the archiving. So it really gives you a great overview of the entire building block offer. So um, do have a look if you haven't done so already. Next slide. Um, in terms of communications, we've got a LinkedIn group. You can see the details on the screen here. We've got a Twitter handle. So again, if you haven't, by some miracle, signed up for the social media by now, please do so. And as Pavel said at the um, very beginning, um, we also have our satisfaction survey, which we're going to uh, give you the link to in a little while. So please do, do fill this out. Uh, we do take note of what you say, and it really helps us define how we're going to uh, take this training forward. So it's really helpful. So that just leaves me to introduce our speakers for today. So I'm really pleased that we have um, we have Anne Kristin Egeland from the Danish National Archives doing the uh, part two of this presentation, the, the sort of technical side of things. Uh, Anne Kristin is one of the key developers of the ERG spatial specification. Um, and our session will be open today by Gregor Zvarsnik, who some of you may remember uh, gave a presentation for us in 2020. So he's coming back to us uh, today to update us on the latest developments in the e-archiving SITS geospatial specification. And he's going to look at how we can all benefit from this specification. So Gregor, it's over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, OK, now we can see the slides. Excellent. So yeah, welcome to this webinar. And uh, as uh, Jamie already said, uh, I will be presenting about how to benefit from the uh, content information type specifications for geospatial records. Uh, because uh, now, after two years, we actually uh, did a major re 
uh, reconstruction and redesign of the 2.0 specification. And uh, let's talk about this presentation, uh, this specification that was done now and how uh, different stakeholders can benefit from it. First, uh, let's see the review of uh, what's on the plan today in my presentation. First, we'll talk about why geospatial uh, content type information uh, specifications at all. Why is this needed? Then we'll talk about uh, the content, so what it contains, what the package is, not just the specifications. You will also get uh, uh, within this bundle uh, guidelines for storing geospatial records where you can see the explanations of the requirements. And of course, uh, a new thing uh, that we provided for you is the guidelines for the usage of these specifications to store uh, GIS systems in a way. Uh, and of course, we'll recap what's new since the 2.0. In the end, we will also talk about how you can start using these specifications based on who you are. Are you a member of the archives who want to start using uh, geospatial data preservation? Uh, are you a solution provider who wants to uh, embed this into their solutions? Or are you a data producer who actually uh, wants to learn more about how to adjust their workflow to support the uh, long-term preservation of geospatial records? And in the end, uh, we will talk about what's waiting for us uh, in the future, uh, what we aim to do uh, in case this project uh, continues or if it doesn't, because uh, this has been started and uh, it's, uh, a lot of people are adopting it and uh, we can include anyone who is interested to proceed with us. So basically, uh, geospatial uh, content information type specifications are a subset of uh, the common uh, specifications uh, for archival packages which basically uh, means that we have a general set of uh, rules how the package needs to be created that is equal for all SITs. I will just name the content information type specifications SITs from now on. So uh, it is the integral part uh, of any uh, package that you have the top structure, uh, which provides interoperability, openness and transparency using the accepted international standards for packaging archival packages and uh, for the workflows based on uh, open archival information system standard. In this uh, sits, we actually uh, added elements that support geospatial records. So you will see that this is a like an onion that's being uh, uh, peeled. So the outer layers are the core uh, sits uh, is in the middle and then we'll also show you how local implementations and specific uh, format implementations can be defined for your local implementation. Now, why preserve geospatial records at all? First of all, everything happens somewhere. And if you want to manage things, you need to know where they are, especially if you have databases uh, that are old and things changed in the, in the, uh, in the environment. Some roads are different, some uh, uh, administrative regions are different. You need to know where they were uh, at the time if you want to use the data properly. The second thing is uh, geospatial records are a form of official records that need to be stored. Like the example of the image uh, on the image is a, a spatial plan where people uh, have designated areas in the city or in the country uh, where you can build or what types of buildings you can build and it also influences the taxes and so on. So it needs to be stored properly, archived for many, many years. Then uh, geospatial records provide, it's a common denominator for all data, the space is. So if you want to show any tangible objects like uh, where the infrastructure is, where the roads are, where the sewage pipes go, you need to draw them somewhere so you can find them. On the other hand, you can also map the intangible uh, assets like uh, uh, how much the GDP grew in certain areas, how much uh, population grew or declined, uh, how things changed uh, based on some uh, different socioeconomic pointers. So that's why if we want to analyze the past, uh, when things changed, we need to have the old geospatial records available for that. 
And last but not least, uh, in the paper about digital uh, economy of the European Europe, uh, of, the, uh, of the digital Europe, uh, geospatial records are uh, mentioned as the cornerstone of digital economy in the future. Uh, it supports analysis across time and it supports uh, an innovative solution based on geospatial data. I mean, you saw what happened when Google Maps came out. Now we can't even live without it. So uh, this is something that uh, will help uh, a lot of innovative solutions to come up because uh, we can uh, have the common denominator, the space uh, set up using geospatial records. So that is why. Now, who is going to use this? Well, basically, in, in the beginning, we aim to support the major uh, stakeholders, which are, uh, of course, the data producers. Uh, by showing them with, with this specification, we can show them uh, the basic concepts and approaches for long-term preservation of geospatial records, because they're usually not aware of it. They usually think about, it will just make a backup and it will be okay, but that is not uh, how things work, because a lot of data can be lost. So uh, using this information and making them aware, the archives can use the specifications to engage with the data producers and have better communication with them. On the other hand, we have the archives who know a lot about preserving geospatial, uh, um, preserving uh, digital records or other records, but they probably lack some understanding of the geospatial records and their specificity. Uh, and these specifications ensure that uh, they will do it properly and to prevent data loss. Because if you can just generalize, ah, oh, we'll make a PDF out of this map, you, little, you lose a lot of in important elements that could be uh, used and very useful in the future. So this is uh, how the archives can also uh, ensure interoperability of their records and uh, increase the data reuse potential and make the archives more valuable in the future if they use a standardized uh, uniform uh, way of preserving geospatial records. And of course, as before, uh, it will help them communicate with the producers more because they will speak more of their language. And of course, the third major player in this story are the solution providers. And by adopting the e-archiving building block uh, elements like uh, modules for creating packages and validators and also specifications on how to use it, it will be cheaper for them to implement it and to maintain because uh, they will have support from the e archiving uh, staff. Uh, they will also map their project scope better to the archival activities and in, if they have an interoperable open solution, they will be uh, better off in the pan-European market because they will be based on standards. Now for the fourth category, which is coming up, especially mentioned uh, with the aforementioned uh, digital Europe uh, and digital economy, are the users. So what we also aimed in this uh, sits is to actually ensure that we have some placeholders where to put um, the digital uh, geospatial records documentation that is machine readable so that it can be found uh, and accessed by uh, some innovative digital economy businesses, some machine applications like AI and uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, applications. And of course, the uh, research community who also uses this data to uh, analyze uh, trends from the past for the better decisions in the future. Now, the next thing I would like to explain is how we divided this uh, specification uh, and how the requirements within the specification are actually split into five major categories. The first category is actually the folder structure requirements. Here is where we uh, actually um, align the structure of the package more with the uh, common information package. Uh, this is the difference between the 2.0 and 3.0. And uh, you will see how we have new suggestions uh, on a new plat, uh, uh, on, on how folders should be structured and where the documentation should be uh, stored. The next is we added a special chapter on maths requirements, which is an essential element within uh, the common information package for validation. Then we have a 
the major, the core requirements are the data requirements. So how data should be stored and which uh, parameters should be checked before storing the data for the long-term preservation. And aside from data, sometimes we need documentation, technical documentation and context documentation. And in the geospatial records, we actually showed uh, which specific uh, additional documentation needs to be uh, stored there so that the data can be used properly. And later, when Anne Christian presents their experience with uh, implementing data and uh, from other implementers, uh, other early adopters of this specification, you will see why some of this documentation is very important to actually properly reuse the data. And of course, uh, geospatial records uh, have their own uh, metadata standards, and we included a chapter that supports uh, the storage and uh, um, the, the use of those standards uh, so that people can find them in the geospatial metadata uh, catalogs. Now to go to the first chapter, which is the folder structure requirements, uh, you see the blue elements, which are the original elements from the common information package. And we added new uh, folders that, that are more placeholders for uh, different types of documentation. So you still store the data within the data folder, but additional documentation can be stored within the documentation folders within the representation or the documentation on the root, as you see it here. So what we did is we actually uh, listened to our users, to the archives who said, we want to have things structured so in a way so that the archives can understand and cover all the bases. And this is the structure based on the significant properties model, which is defined on the link you see below. And so you see that aside from content, we also have structure, rendering, and behavior. So these are the way, this is the way we organize things. And a specific element is a CRS, which actually stands for a coordinate reference system. This is something very specific and very important for geospatial records. We have a special folder for that. But uh, data can also, about the uh, coordinate system can also be stored uh, in the data itself, in the data folder itself. To show you how we uh, try to split the types of uh, data, uh, some data are machine readable, standardized, that can be reused in the machine applications later on. And some data are just uh, descriptive, like PDFs or uh, images. And uh, we wanted to, 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 to separate that uh, the machine readable data is stored within the representations so that when someone accesses this, uh, they can access it within the special placeholders. And if there's other additional information that needs to be read, like PDFs or images or videos, they can be stored within the documentation folder. Now, based on uh, a lot of comments from different users, uh, we did not make this uh, mandatory because there are some requirements where people would like to store data within their own structure. So these uh, folders that are additional in this structure are strong, strongly re recommended, but not mandatory. Now, um, next chapter is actually the chapter about the METS file requirements, which basically uh, tells us how um, to describe the content within the package uh, as geospatial. So we have two possibilities of describing this in the two METS files. So one METS file is on the root of the package, which tells you in general if this package contains geospatial records or not. And uh, people might use this as a element for uh, validation uh, or for the selection of validation tools. And the second one, you can actually designate the, the representation as having uh, geospatial records. Uh, this is just uh, the beginning of the use of the METS for this. Uh, we still uh, want to see this uh, vocabulary expanded in the future. And uh, we would like you who will adopt this uh, or try out this specification to, to give us big feedback on that, uh, because we need to grow the requirements for geospatial uh, preservation from within the community, not from just theoretical background. 
The next uh, major core of requirements are actually the data requirements. So we have the general data requirements that are required uh, within the geospatial records, like the, the package should contain at least one uh, geospatial record, unless it's not, uh, if, if it doesn't, then it's not a geospatial package, right? And then we have specific elements for the vector requirements and uh, raster requirements. Uh, but this is still very general, and uh, there are specific uh, requirements that apply only to certain formats and certain types of geospatial records, like the difference is if you have an image, there are different requirements that if, than if you have a vector uh, geospatial record. So that's why we uh, introduced a new concept, which is called a long-term preservation format profile, which is actually a profile that defines specific validation elements for the specific format. And you will see more about this uh, in the appendixes, where we actually helped you by providing two examples of how this uh, long-term pre preservation format looked like. So geospatial records vary in type and in content. And sometimes you want to have a special format for geospatial records, like a GML or a shapefile or something else. Or you can have a TIFF or a GeoTIFF or a JPEG 2000 format. So you want to specify how those formats need to be validated. And there are different tools for validation of that. And this is why we need some specific profiles uh, so you also might have a local implementation where you would like, like require specific validation rules, like uh, for instance, the data should only be within this border or the data should be within this uh, um, language or something like that. Uh, so if you want to learn more about it, look at the profile for geospatial vector data using GML 3.21 and uh, there's another one for the raster data using TIFF baseline six. And in the bottom, you see the, how the requirement looked like. And uh, one of the requirements that is specific to a local implementation is that the GML file should not be bigger than one gigabyte. Now, someone can use uh, GML files bigger than that. But on the other hand, uh, this is what the local implementation uh, actually requires. So, here you see how these profiles can actually benefit you. And uh, if you develop your own, uh, we would like to share them among uh, the community so that we can all create better uh, validation requirements. Now we have the next uh, type of uh, elements in the package are the documentation requirements. So the requirements on how to document the geodata in the IP for technical reuse. In the OIS terms, we call this uh, representation information. One thing is, of course, to stir the structure of the geospatial records. And here we offer a, an example using an international standard for that. Uh, you can also uh, store different types of uh, rendering, which is how the data should be uh, set to create a map, uh, what, uh, what colors are used, what uh, statistical approaches are used to actually color the, 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 the images and so on. Then we can also store the behavior because sometimes the data itself uh, doesn't give us much. What we want to do is use the data to replicate a result of a system. And this result is based on a recipe, on a process, and we can store those processes in terms of diagrams or SQL queries or Python scripts, which are not long-term preservation formats, but they can be still used uh, to understand uh, uh, the logic behind it. So how the data behave to produce the structure. And of course, the most important thing is to store the coordinate systems and uh, to document them because uh, a lot of data uh, has a very vague definition of coordinate system, but it references some external elements which cannot be basically stored in the archive. So we need to have a documentation on how to store the coordinate systems. If there is other documentation, you can also store it here, uh, but these are the major ones. So the last module is actually talking about the geospatial metadata, which is actually something that we use in the geospatial community to enhance findability. 
So we describe the, the records, we describe their parameters, their quality, their origin, and so on. And uh, these are very similar to the archival uh, metadata. However, there are some specific elements, and that's why we encourage people to store the geospatial metadata within the package as content. We support the um, geospatial metadata in various uh, standardized formats, and also you can store a separate uh, representation uh, if you have some non-standardized metadata, like just a local database that you created on your own. Um, just to have something uh, for us to find and maybe to recreate the geospatial uh, standardized uh, metadata in the future. And that's uh, how we can actually support the proprietary machine readable metadata. So if we know into which folder to put it, then uh, we can access this element and because it's, it is standardized, you can actually use it uh, to analyze which, what type of data is in the package. Uh, specifically using some geospatial specific parameters. Now, aside from the package itself, we also created guidelines for SIDS geospatial. The guidelines are actually uh, first uh, introducing the geospatial records uh, concepts and uh, some basic information, which is what we said uh, uh, would help the archivists learn more about geospatial records. The second thing is we introduced the geosignificant properties concepts, which actually help the data producers understand which elements and uh, which types of documentation is required so that the data can be reused in the future. And uh, of course, we rationalized and explained every requirement in the SITS uh, guideline, I mean, in the SITS uh, specification. Uh, so for every guideline, uh, we have also some uh, examples and uh, some possible solutions. Uh, but this is a document that will grow across time because more people will post more, more questions. We will add to this document. And this is where the knowledge base about the SIT geospatial uh, is actually being built. Now, new to this um, uh, package in the 3.0 version is the guidelines for SIT geospatial with GIS. Um, this comes in handy when where, uh, you have uh, complex information systems that are used uh, using geospatial records, and you don't want to store the records themselves alone. You also, also want to store the more complex uh, structure of how data was used and maybe some behavior. And this is where into, uh, we created a separate guideline where, uh, where we have an introduction to GIS systems uh, chapter to explain it to, to the archivist, to the users, to everyone. Uh, then we also talk about the uh, um, suggested G GIS preservation strategies, how the data producers should include uh, a preservation step in their life cycle uh, so that it actually archiving is included into the life cycle by design. Uh, so also the solution providers can then see uh, some of these uh, GIS preservation strategies and adopt it uh, within their solutions for the data producers or for the archives. And of course, uh, we selected certain chapters of the SIDS geospatial uh, validation requirements and added a specific explanations suitable more for GIS uh, purposes. Like, for instance, if you have multiple data sets in multiple coordinate systems, you need to also store the transformations between these two coordinate systems. So we also have explain, uh, uh, an explanation for that and uh, some examples on how to do it. Uh, we also show more examples of how to use uh, uh, standards for defining structure between uh, some web services and uh, how, to, how to store that using some uh, standards like OWS context uh, that is supported within the geospatial community and so on and so on. So these two guidelines basically give you uh, information about how to use it and how to implement it uh, based on what type of stakeholder you are. So if we now make an overview of what is new in the 3.0. So basically, if we see uh, the SITS geospatial was just one document in the um, 
previous uh, version, uh, but now we split it to actually three documents. Basically, all the explanations and examples were moved into the guidelines where we can actually grow and uh, make it uh, uh, more informative. And uh, SIT's geospatial uh, document now only contains elements uh, that are validation requirements. Uh, aside from the 2.0 version, we added the MATS requirements, uh, which are now uh, supporting the uh, common information package structure. Uh, we updated the structure to be more uh, flexible and uh, to allow for different types of uh, reorganization of data within the package. And of course, we introduced the long-term preservation profiles, which actually help us uh, create a library of different uh, long-term preservation profiles. Uh, we aim to, uh, uh, to gather all these types of profiles as a community so that people can choose from them and uh, also build validators from them and converters from them uh, to somehow uh, introduce uh, some flexibility, but on the other hand, also uh, interoperability within the community. Now, uh, within the guidelines, we added uh, explanations and examples for each and every uh, validation requirement. And we have the new guidelines for uh, CIT Geospatial uh, for GIS uh, here. I see there, there's a typo, the GIS part is missing here. Um, so the intro to new to GIS systems, as I explained before, uh, we talked about the examples for GIS structures and uh, examples for uh, coordinate system transformations and uh, how we can actually also use long-term preservation profiles for GIS-specific uh, formats like web services. So this SIT specification actually does not define how to store and preserve uh, web services, but it gives you a good uh, fundamental uh, structure based on which we can build this because we saw that different stakeholders have different needs and requirements so we need to allow them to actually um, contribute to this specification uh, based on their requirements and needs. Okay, so almost near the final chapter, uh, how to get started with geospatial data preservation. Uh, some people say, okay, so we have the SIT geospatial and this is all uh, that we need to actually start with the preservation of geospatial records. Well, we tried that and we had a one month uh, case study with an archive who had no idea about geospatial records and we said, here's the geospatial uh, SITs. Uh, let's see what happens if you just try to use this. And here is what we learned. We learned that first of all, uh, people should learn more about geospatial records. So there's a requirement for more courses or uh, more uh, information or resources for you to learn about geospatial records if you're just a beginner. Because geospatial records are very complex. Uh, they contain elements like databases. Uh, behavior is often uh, uh, defined within the structure of the combination of data sets. You can have different types of uh, records that are, uh, I don't know, vectors uh, or rasters, or you can have point clouds, or you can have uh, 3D objects and so on. Uh, so basically, you need to learn about the use cases and the needs so that you will understand the specification requirements. The second thing you need to do in the archives is, this is not something you can do in the afternoon for a hobby. You need to allocate resources within the archive or within your uh, organization if you're geospatial data producers. So the preservation requires a lot of disk space because geospatial records can be huge. Uh, you need to have some geospatial tools to actually manage them, to, uh, to visualize them, to validate them and so on. You need to have qualified personnel uh, that you can outsource, uh, like the company I work for, uh, or you can educate your own people 
in in the archive or in the in, in the organization. Then what you would also need to do, you would need to revise your workflows um, because uh, there are certain steps in the workflow that are specific to geospatial records, and these steps actually. Uh, include validation and visualization and in the management of geodata you need to have some conversion tools and so on so if you know what you need to do a good and optimized workflow can save you a lot of time and geospatial data requires adjustment in this, all, the, all of the steps within the OIS process so this is what you can do on your own on the other hand if you're an archive you need to engage the community because if you want to preserve geospatial records, you, you, you usually preserve them for someone, for the end user. And most often, the biggest end user is your data producer. So you need to identify their needs through cooperation, through uh, speaking on their conferences, speaking on uh, their meetings, or uh, introducing them to the importance of the preservation of geospatial records. Uh, and also cooperate in the creation of local guidelines of, on the local uh, long-term preservation format profiles. Then, if, if you're an archive and you want to present your data or analyze your data or validate your data, you need to get authoritative base maps. This is what the first uh, step in everyone's mind is, oh, I can get some data on Google Maps or I can get some OpenStreet data, but this data is not authoritative. And also, if you have some old maps, or old geospatial records, you would need to have authoritative data from that period of time. And you have organizations in your land, in your country where, where you can get this, or if you are a producer of geospatial records, then uh, you need to know if your data that you use for your ba base maps are authoritative and how it was created and based on what um, type of information you want to preserve. So that's why uh, prioritization of the acquisition of base maps from different time periods for the archives is crucial. And last but not least is exchange experiences. Share your experiences, post your questions in organizations like the DLM forum or uh, the, the OpenGIS consortium or uh, start talking on conferences uh, where people talk about geospatial records and try to uh, do that. Uh, we in the archiving building block uh, have the support uh, desk uh, where we can give you answers or questions, uh, but we will also uh, help you by showing you where the communities that work with this are so that you can engage them. And this is uh, basically what we wanted to cover in this presentation. So to summarize, uh, the new SITS for geospatial is uh, more extendable. It supports multiple standards and formats, and it includes new guidelines for easier implementation. But to actually uh, implement this proper way, uh, you need to collaborate with us, with uh, someone who knows more about geospatial records, with different archives, with different data producers, uh, because I think that the power is in numbers and uh, we want this seed specification to actually be uh, created in the future by using uh, information from the ground up. And uh, by getting information from you guys, what you need and what you would like to do in the future, then we could get your user needs and create a better product for you so that we can make uh, digital Europe interoperable in the geospatial domain. So this is uh, all I had to say, and I'm giving my word back to Jamie. Thank you, Gregor. Um, so now we hand over to Anne Kristen Egland uh, from the Danish National Archives. Thank you, Jamie. And can I have my slides, please? Um, today, I will share some uh, impressions from early adapters of the SITS2 spatial specification with you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And um, what I will do is that I will um, 
go through some questions from the early adopters of the situ spatial specification um, to explain and illustrate selected core requirements of the, the uh, situ spatial specification in more detail. And you see the three questions here that I will um, go through. The first is, why is my geodata of Finland displayed next to Great Britain? And the next question is, how do I identify a relevant geodata file in my information package that is uh, stored in the preservation storage? And finally, how far is work on the GeoZip validator from the EARC project? Next slide, please. Uh, and the aim of this presentation is to invite you to help develop the validation tools for uh, the submission information packages with uh, geodata, which are compliant with the SIG geospatial specification. Uh, let's de develop these tools together so we can all use them, even though we have local implementation, as maybe we do have um, some, um, some requirements that we can all agree upon and make validation tools for. Uh, we would also like to encourage you to implement the SIDSTU spatial specification in your archive when preserving and using geospatial data or in your library, or in your company, or wherever you have your geospatial data. Um, and the, the aim of this presentation is also to make it easy, easier for you to understand and read the SIDS geospatial specification. And, um, and I hope um, my three questions that I will go through here will also explain um, why these requirements are necessary when preserving geospatial data. Next slide, please. And what will you learn? Um, I hope you will get a better understanding of the selected and central requirements of this specification. And you will also see what troubles uh, adapt us of, uh, when preserving geodata using this specification. Uh, and you will also, in the end, know what geodata validation tools are all already available so far and what tools will be developed in the, in the, near, yeah, in the future. Next slide, please. So the first question is this one. Next slide, yes. Why is my geodata of Finland displayed next to Great Britain? And the question that I had from Markus uh, Merenmis from the National Archives of Finland was that he said that when I open my Finnish data set uh, and a background map, or I think that was Gregor called a base map uh, in the, <clears throat> in the QGIS tool, I can see that the data set is in the middle of the ocean and not in Finland. Why is that? Uh, and you can see that uh, in the, th these are actually uh, visualizations of uh, Marcus's data. And as you can see, Finland is the, the red circle uh, in the first map, but the data set is um, a bit lower uh, out in the sea next to Britain. Next slide, please. And the answer to this question uh, is, um, uh, it is related to this requirement from the SIG geospatial specification. It's uh, the requirement GU15 uh, called CRS definition. And it states that every geospatial data set must be accompanied with information about its underlying coordinate reference system in one of two ways. Um, I won't read the ways, but you, you can document this information about the coordinate and reference system uh, either as descriptions or, as Gregor said, the, the geo da spatial data file can also um, contain information about the CRS used for the geodata or a reference uh, to a CRS registry. So you can do it in many ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then you can ask yourself, why is this information about the co coordinate reference system so important to preserve? Um, that is basically because you have to display uh, your geodata in a coordinate reference system that corresponds to the coordinate reference system of your geodata. If you do not do that, the geodata will not be placed correctly on the two-dimensional two representation of the Earth. Um, and um, 
um, you can use different met different methods uh, to uh, project or transform the the three D the three dimensional Earth into a two dimensional map of the Earth, and a couple of them I explained here. There's the cone and and the cylindrical with curves and the cylindrical with, with lines, um, and you can see that illustrated uh, on the on the figure there. Um, but depending on the method you use for this um, transformation from 2D to 3D, uh, the coordinate reference system will look differently um, on the 2D uh, map. So uh, either, as you see on, in the bottom, the cylindrical line uh, projection method used, there the, the countries or uh, are like stretched out and uh, in the cone method uh, used to transform the, the 2D to 3D, all the countries are like uh, smashed into the middle uh, of the map. So what I try to illustrate here is that if you take uh, a coordinate, a, a geodata, a point uh, that you measured uh, on the Earth um, and your geodata is actually in the cylindrical line projection, that's how you measured your geodata, um, it will be placed differently on the three different projections here. Uh, in the bottom, in the cylindrical lines, you see that the, 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 the black dot, the, the point, the geodata, is uh, in the middle of uh, Central America somewhere. But in the cone projection, it's, it's, uh, if it's still in the cylindrical line CRS system, but you put it into um, a, a background map or a coordinate reference system that is a, in a cone projection, uh, then it will be placed in the middle of the ocean and not in Central America. And I know this is a very simplified explanation of this, but it just to illustrate the point uh, that the, in, the information about the coordinate reference system is very important. Uh, next slide, please. And it, yes. Um, and this uh, this is what I just explained here. I just put in uh, some grids uh, to show you that what I did was I took geodata that was um, measured or preserved in the cylindrical line projection, uh, the CRS with the cylindrical line projection. Um, and if you use that same pro uh, geo if you put that same geodata in this, which is uh, born in the CRS, and put it into other um, yeah, other projections, um, they will be placed the same, but in the ocean and so on. So that was just to explain what I did before. Next slide, please. So the answers uh, to Marcus' question is, um, in his case, it was because that the CRS of the Finnish data set um, was in a different coordinate reference system than in the uh, than the background map was in. And uh, Marcus actually looked at his data and at his background map, and he could see that the data set was in this uh, EPSG code uh, 3067, which is a coordinate reference system often used in Finland, I guess, because it covers Finland very well. But the background map was in, an, um, in a coordinate reference system uh, often used for open streets maps maps, the uh, VGS84. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So what is the solution to Marcus' problem here? Well, um, to view the Finnish data set, um, which is measured and born and preserved in the EPSG uh, 3067, you should also use a background map uh, in the same coordinate reference uh, system. Um, and um, you can, well, one uh, advice to Marcus is just to download a background map from the map agency in this right CIS or maybe migrate a, a background map to the right CRS so they correspond with the, the geospatial data. Uh, but as um, Gregor also mentioned, this uh, question also raises other important questions because um, must uh, geospatial data sets always be viewed on top of the original background map, uh, which Gregor explained to us, the historical background map, 
uh, in the original CIS to really reflect the original data, uh, which is le a legally binding decision uh, could be based upon uh, the data in your archive. Um, uh, is that the case? And how does that? <clears throat> Uh, how do we do that if we have the migration strategy in the archive where we actually migrate the data to other coordinate reference systems along the way? Because the coordinate re reference system uh, is, uh, do not live forever. There, there comes new along all the time and some of the old are not used in, in, in newer GIS um, applications. Um, so, if this is really the case, must the archive also preserve the, all the historical background maps in the original uh, coordinate reference systems? And I don't have the answers uh, to it, these uh, questions, um, but we should definitely discuss that in the community of digital preservation of geospatial data. Uh, and also, Marcus asked uh, which background maps are suitable. Um, or maybe I, I rephrase this question, but you could ask which background maps are suitable for purposes of future uses of the archive geospatial data set. Um, should it be a background map that shows lakes or streets or even have city names and so on? Which background maps are actually uh, suited for the purpose of the user? And can you can you just choose a background map that that is most suitable, or should you always use the original historical background map used when data was created? So I don't really have the solution, but I can say that in Den at the Danish National Archive, um, we have this migration strategy and, and we always migrate data and submission to only one single coordinate reference system uh, covering uh, the area of Denmark. So, so we, we don't, preserve the background, the historical background maps uh, for that specific, specific uh, geospatial data set. But uh, the, the idea is that you can always in the future and in 500 years, download a background map from the map agency uh, to view you, your archive data upon that. But is that the right decision? I'm not sure anymore, but that's what we do. Next slide, please. We also have uh, another requirement regarding the coordinate reference system in the uh, in the SIS geospatial specification, and that's requirement G16. And this requirement uh, is uh, re regarding the geographic location validation uh, will reveal uh, when a transformation from one coordinate reference system to another go wrong during, for example, submission or migration of the geospatial da uh, data in the archive. Um, and the requirement states that the ge geographies in the geospatial uh, records should be located within a fixed bounding box defined in the submission agreement between the producer and the archive according to the expected location and extent of the data set. Next slide, please. And to illustrate what this requirement is all about, um, this uh, image shows a validation where some of the coordinates of the geospatial data set, or the orange points, um, they are outside the light blue bounding box. So a bounding box is like this square or rectangle covering the area that your data should be inside. Um, so next slide, please. And in this case, um, the, the problem is the other way around. Uh, uh, before, the, the problem was that the background map was not in the same series as the actually preserved data. But in this case, uh, this, um, the problem here is that the, the background map is actually in a correct coordinator reference system, but the, co the, all the, the geospatial data set uh, is transformed wrongly to this same uh, coordinate uh, reference system. So it, it really isn't in that uh, CRS. That is the only CRS that we allow at the Danish National Archive. Um, and this requirement um, uh, and this uh, that enables this validation, it actually uh, revealed that that there had been a wrong transformation uh, of the geospatial data. Uh, on submission to the archive. So that is why uh, 
uh, we at the Danish National Archive find that this is a really important requirement and a really important validation to do uh, on your uh, geospatial data. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows you how the geospatial data set is, is looking when it's transformed correctly to the CRS uh, uh, that we allow in Den at the Danish National Archives. And, um, and here, th these orange dots show uh, shipwrecks uh, around in the Danish Sea, and now they are located correctly along the coastline of Denmark and not uh, to the side of it. Next slide, please. So, to sum up, uh, preserving descriptions and in the information package about the actual uh, CRS of your geospatial data set in the information package is very important. And um, it's important to enable you to view and use this geospatial data correctly in the future. And this requirement in the SITS geospatial uh, specification, these requirements ensure that uh, the GEO 15 and GEO 16. So next slide, please. And now we go to question two. Next slide. This question is actually from myself because I am also, or the Danish National Archives, uh, also one of the early adopters of this um, geo SITS geospatial specification. And uh, I wonder, when I follow the requirements in the specification, how do I identify a relevant geodata file in the information package? And to state, to yeah, uh, often a user of the archive asks for very spe specific geospatial information. It could be a, a question like, could you give me a map of protected sites from 2000 to 2003 three from this specific region in Denmark? Um, next slide, please. And this um, this has something to do with metadata. It has something to do with how do you describe uh, your your geospatial data set in the information package. Um, and the requirement U17 uh, provides a description of each geospatial data set in the information package. And it states that every geospatial data set must be accompanied by a metadata file that describes the data set with the basic required information. And next slide, please. Um, also, uh, GEO42 is another requirement uh, that recommends that these uh, descriptions of the geospatial data sets are provided uh, in a standardized machine readable format. Uh, that could be the Inspire metadata rules or an ISO standard of uh, some sort. Um, next slide, please. And this is just uh, to illustrate um, this kind of standard. What kind of information is in these metadata files? Uh, often the data set would have a type, title or a and a description, which is called a resource abstract here, and also information about lineage, uh, who created the data, and how have we processed the data along um, the way, and uh, it also, when it is Inspire, uh, the Inspire metadata rules used here, you should also put in some uh, topic categories on your data set or spatial data themes according to the Inspire data themes and so on. And as you can see, there's also information about a bounding box, which area does the data set really cover? So the the, the bounding box, for example, is some of the, the geospatial metadata that we normally don't find in other um, digital records in the archive. And that's why um, these metadata, metadata standards are, are, are suited for geospatial data. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so if we do have requirements on how to describe your uh, geospatial data sets in the information package, then what's the problem? Um, my problem is that often at the Danish National Archives, uh, we have information packages with more than one geospatial file. Uh, we have this local requirement that you should uh, separate your data in smaller files that are uh, smaller than one uh, gigabyte. Um, so 
for example, if you have an information packet with uh, one geospatial data set, that could be, yeah, that could be all the roads in Denmark, for example. Uh, but you have to divide it into three GML files, uh, smaller than one gigabyte. Then usually we, not usually, but you could do this by um, parting it into files that cover different par main parts of Denmark, for example. And that's what I try to illustrate here, uh, the map of Denmark. We have the big island ca called Jutland, a smaller one called Funen, and then Sealand. So each GML file could cover each of these parts of Denmark, for example. That would be a logical parting of the geospatial uh, data set. Um, but, and then um, if I have to find a specific file for an archival use of this uh, information package, then how do I know which GML file contains geodata from which part of Denmark? That's the question that I have to be able to answer. And also, if I should put a metadata file for the geodata set in the information package, does that mean that each GML file should have an Inspire metadata file? Uh, where I describe all the regions covered in that file to really enable a search of a specific file with geodata from a specific region. Is that how I should do it? And also, as you can see, there are a lot of small islands around um, Denmark as well. And which GML file will they be covered by? Um, where, which part of Denmark do they really belong to? How do I know that? Um, these are the questions that I need to answer to be able to find a specific file for uh, the use of the archive. And next slide, please. And uh, of course, if you only have an information package with one single uh, geospatial file, you don't have this problem. And even if you have three files, you might just open all three of them and see what they contain and then uh, deliver one of those. But what if you have an information package with 16 GML files or 10,000 GML files, then you have this uh, need of um, searching for a specific file um, covering a specific area. And um, apart from the logical way of parting files uh, with the main parts of Denmark, often we uh, also use this uh, tiling uh, or grid method where you just split Denmark maybe into 16 uh, squares and then each file cover one square. And again, I uh, would need to know which um, GML file uh, contains geodata from which tile. And uh, again, should I then have 16 Inspire metadata files to describe each geodata uh, data file in the information package? Um, and how should I describe them? How do I describe what tile contains which information and so on? So this is what's troubling us in, in Denmark because we do have information packages with lots of um, geospatial files inside them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and a solution to this problem um, if this um, metadata, standardized metadata file is not suitable enough for the user need here to, to enable search of a specific file from a specific region, then this requirement GU43 uh, states that you can also um, have non-standardized machine readable geospatial metadata. Um, and I'll just read it up. Uh, read it aloud, uh, a, copy, a copy of geospatial metadata in a non-long-term preservation representations may be stored in its original form as databases or documentation. Um, and I won't read further on because it complicates things a lot, but next slide, please. And here I try to illustrate what this requirement is all about. Um, when, when we preserve metadata in a database format, what we do actually is preserve it as a kind of data because often database contain uh, digital records of data. But what uh, you can do it in this way that you preserve um, a database in your information package with all this metadata describing each file in the information package. And, uh, and I tried to illustrate here that 
the first uh, row of this uh, table in the database uh, explains that uh, the GML file path, the GML file path, uh, path uh, one in the information package, uh, all the files you can see, the, the green files over there, uh, what they actually cover. Um, here, there are some metadata. There's the, the theme, what is the, the, the geospatial record? What is it? Is it an area of a protected uh, site, for example? And also there's the name of the protected site and uh, maybe the name of the municipal and the region where this protected site is, uh, is placed. So uh, now as a user of this information package, I can search into this uh, database, for example, if I need to find um, geospatial data from a specific region, I could uh, search the name of a region, the Hulstan, that's the capital region of Denmark, and then I can see which GML files to actually contain uh, protected sites from that area. And this is actually the solution that we use at the moment. And but we are, and we might use that in the future as well. Um, and it is a requirement in the SIS geospatial uh, specification, so you can use this uh, if you need it, as we do. Next slide, please. Um, but. Um, the next question for us is how do we combine um, database uh, spatial record the, in a CR format, for example, uh, and then the GML file, the, the SIDS, yeah, a, a special preservation format profile for GML. How do I combine that uh, in the information package? Uh, as the specifications are right now, we have this SIDS ge uh, geospatial. Uh, specification for geodata only and not for database information. So we really need to look at all the different uh, constant information type specification and see how can we combine those in an information package. And uh, we are working at this in the, at the Danish National Archives because we, we might have this need. Uh, so it's not there yet if you have the same need. Next slide, please. So. To sum up, uh, do consider how you describe your uh, geodata files and in the information package to enable search uh, of uh, specific geodata files in the information package if you do have that user need in the future. And these are the requirements um, that cover that user need or the requirements about metadata. Next slide, please. And finally, the last question. Is question three. And I got this question from Martin Rectorik from the National Archives of Czech Republic. And he asked me, how far is the work on the GeoSIP validator? Has the, the work on the GeoSIP validator progressed? Uh, we would like to use it, but we would like to know whether we can allow use of Czech names for folders, not for mandatory EARC folders, but only for subfolders in the information package. And uh, next slide, please. And I split this question into two because first he asked, can we allow you use of check names for subfolders? And the answer is yes, according to the SIDS geospatial specification, you can allow use of check names of subfolders. And he sent me this illustration uh, uh, of an information package structure where the green box um, surrounds all the subfolders of the information package and the blue box um, is showing the mandatory EARC folders uh, according to the SIDS geospatial specification and to the CSIP specification with the mandatory folder structure. Next slide, please. And how do I read this out of the specification? Well, actually, there are no requirements stating that you can name your subfolders whatever you like. But we there are requirements um, on how to name uh, subfolders of the document folder in the information package. But they are only recommendations. Uh, they are optional. And those are the subfolders that uh, Gregor also mentioned. Um, subfolders for structure, documentation of structure of the geospatial data, the rendering of the geospatial 
data and the behavior and so on, and also the coordinate reference system, as they mentioned too. Um, next slide, please. And then how far is work uh, on the GeoSIP validation tool? Um, the answer, I haven't uh, talked to um, the developers of the tool, so they might be a bit further, but as far as I know, the EARC GeoSIP validator is not uh, done yet. But um, they are working on it, and it should validate uh, these requirements. Uh, first of all, whether the information package is compliant with the uh, common specification for information packages, and that is primarily the folder structure, the outer folder structure of the information package, and uh, that METS files exist and um, yes, uh, and looks like they are required to look like, and um, the. GeoSIP validator should also validate um, requirements from the SIDS geospatial specification, the Geo1 to Geo10. Uh, and those are primarily requirements uh, for the METS file. How do, you, uh, how do you structure the METS file? What uh, vocabularies do you use to fill in values and so on? And I will go into a bit more detail about that now. Next slide. For example, there's a requirement, the GU2 requirement in the specification um, about filling out uh, a value in the type element of the METS file. And it states that for information packages that primarily contains geospatial data, the value in pa the package METS uh, file and in the type element must be geospatial data as taken from the CZIP vocabulary uh, for category content category. Um, and I illustrated the, the, the content of the vocabulary for content category, where you can see the element uh, geospatial data, the value there that you should use if you have information packages that primarily contains geospatial data. And uh, what is the purpose of um, putting in this value in the METS file? What is it used for? because it cannot be used for validation because um, the, the term geospatial data doesn't say anything about the form format of the data and the information package or the requirements for the geospatial data. So the purpose of this type value in the METS file, uh, I guess, is to enable search of information packages um, that has the constant category mentioned here, for example, geospatial data, then you can search for all information packages with geospatial data. And note that um, the cardinality is one-to-one, -one, so you can only put in one value. So even though your information package might also have some uh, database uh, data in the data folder, um, you cannot write it here if it's primarily geospatial data. Next slide, please. And this is just to remind you, as Gregor also said, that uh, to this specification, we also uh, have this guideline uh, where you can read um, a description of the requirements uh, and see an example and also uh, read about why is this requirement important, as I just uh, explained to you with the type element. What is it used for? And next slide, please. Um, there's also the requirement U3 about the content information type specification. And it states that for information packages that primarily contain geospatial data, the value in the package match file and in the element content information type must be SIDS geospatial version 3. Uh, Point o, uh, or underscore O as taken from the CC vocabulary for detailed content types type. And this information is actually the information needed to be able to validate that this uh, information package um, is compliant with the SIT uh, specification mentioned in this element. So if you have used this SIT geospatial um, specification version 3, as Greg had just explained, uh, pre presented for you, uh, and you, you uh, add that value in the METS file, then a validation tool will validate whether this information package uh, 
is compliant with all the requirements, all the must requirements, uh, the, the mandatory requirements in this specification. Um, and I put in the, the content of this vocabulary, as, and as you can see, the, the value here is geodata and not sits geospatial version 3.0, uh, but that's, as Greg has said, the vocabulary will be extended with these values um, in the uh, soon, I guess. Next slide, please. So now we have uh, values in the match file that explains it contains geodata and also explain which uh, specification is used for the um, for the structure and the match file and so on. The SITS, which uh, constant information type specification is used. But uh, the question arises, how is the content of the information pack cat package then validated automatically? The, the content of the data folder, the actual uh, uh, geospatial files that you put into the information folder. Um, <clears throat> because the GeoZip validation tool does not validate the data in the information package, nor does it validate the metadata, because it's up to the local implementation to choose which metadata standard to use uh, to describe the data in the information package. And nor does it um, validate the subfolders of the information package, because they can have Czech names or Danish names, and they can be called whatever uh, you need to call them uh, to enable use of them in the future. Uh, so my question is, how does this EARC GeoZip uh, validation tool know which other validation module to execute to actually validate the content? Um, and as far as I'm concerned, we still need some values in the METS file that, um, uh, that explain which, for example, uh, which preservation uh, format profile is used for the actual data and so on. But we are working on this, so that might be added to the uh, SITS geospatial specification or to any, maybe it should be added in the local implementations, I don't know, but um, we need that, I guess. And um, I show you here an example of how one could make such a requirement uh, with a value that actually tells the validation tool how to validate the data. And, and this requirement is, is just a copy of the requirement that is put in the, um, the constant information uh, specification type for uh, the preservation of databases, the CIAT format. They have a similar um, uh, requirement that enables uh, actual validation of the CIAT file in the data uh, folder. So, for example, we could add a requirement about for um, uh, if for any uh, constant information type uh, for, uh, with the value sits geospatial, there should be uh, an other constant information type value or attribute uh, which state which um, preservation profile was used for data, for example. But please comment on, on this if you have any other solutions. We would like to hear about it um, before we uh, finish the development of the validation tool. Next slide, please. So to sum up, work on the EARC GeoZip validator is still going on. Um, and as I showed you, only requirement U3 about the constant information type specification uh, actually enables this automated validation of the GeoZip. So that's really important to fill out. And if you don't use the this uh, SIDS geospatial specification, you can actually use the other content information type element and just put in your own uh, specification uh, from your own vocabulary and then validate according to that as well. So, uh, so you don't have to uh, use this SIDS uh, geospatial specification to be able uh, to use the validation tool. Next slide, please. Yes, so what happens next? Uh, with this SIDS geospatial specification and the development of the tools, um, first of all, the specification is now available on the DILSA Sport website. And um, we would really encourage you to try out the SIDS geospatial specification and give us some feedback. For example, like um, Martin and Marcus, who tried to 
uh, create an information package that is compliant with the specification? What troubles do they meet? What do they not understand? Do we need to make better guidelines for you to be able to implement this specification? Please let us know if you do so. And about the tool development, um, as I said, the eARC project is working on completing the validation tool um, for the SIDS geospatial requirements. And also at the Danish National Archives, uh, we do plan to develop local validation tools or modules um, for, for, for the actual, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the actual data files, the vector files and the raster files. And we will describe those uh, validation criteria and requirements uh, in um, preservation format specifications. Um, also what we also call profiles. Um, yes, and if we could, I, as, as I see it, uh, just as Martin uh, and the Czech National uh, Archive has a need for naming subfolders uh, with, uh, in their national language and so on, we have the same requirement. So maybe we could work together and see, uh, could we make a, an open source module that is very dynamic that we can all use in some way uh, because we do have common needs for the validation. Not all, uh, all validation needs are common, but some are. Uh, and also Martin has told me that the National Archives of Czech Republic um, is planning to develop a simple validator for a GeoSIP compliant with the SIDS geospatial, uh, but this, uh, a validation tool will also um, allow check names of actually the EARC root folders. Um, and of course, this tool will also validate the, the content of the METS files, checksums and structure of the GeoSIP as well. So those are some of the plans. Uh, and my next slide, please. And I would like to hear if you have any plans about preserving geospatial data. Please speak up if you do. That's all for me. Thank you so much to uh, the speakers that we had in today's webinar. Thank you so much, Anne Kristen Eglin and uh, Gregor Zavznik, um, for your very in depth presentation. We, we, we are we are going to the question and answer portion of our uh, webinar, but before we do, I would like to ta uh, take your attention and uh, to the satisfaction survey. The webinar is almost over, so you do have enough information to fill it out. We do uh, look at the responses that you put in your in the satisfaction survey to maybe the next series of webinars to make them. Uh, to fit them to your needs, to fit them what you like, uh, we do take your comments into consideration. So on to the first question, uh, and we already have one. Can you elaborate on what kind of adjustments to OAIS processes geospatial records require? Yes. Uh, so when we analyze the OIS processes in the first eARC project, uh, back in 2015, uh, we saw that we would need to add some additional steps to uh, actually uh, satisfy the needs of the geospatial records. Like in the ingest process, uh, you have the content validation and a test DIP creation. And in order to validate if the content is, uh, uh, is actually usable, you need to create and recreate the um, GS environment similarly to what uh, it was uh, in the original system. And this is where we need to add the elements to check for all the uh, content that we actually prescribed uh, in, the, in the package. For instance, we would need to check if the data uh, has the right coordinate system, if the, um, the, the, the rendering information is good enough so that we can understand and uh, recreate it and so on. And uh, this is just one of the steps. Uh, uh, other steps are we would need to add or expand some uh, workflows or steps when we want to manage the data in the AIP 
for instance, if we want to change formats or change coordinate systems, like Anne Christine said or mentioned, uh, and especially to add to those uh, for those requirements that are listed uh, in the um, uh, in the list of requirements in the SITs. So um, that is basically what it, what I what I wanted to say about this topic, and I hope uh, I answered the question. I think you you did, but if if any if the original question answer uh, the person who answered the question wants any further comments, um, you can they can also uh, ask a follow up question. I think that everybody is writing their questions right now as we speak. Um, so I didn't forget about you, Jamie. Thank you so much for putting on all these webinars. This is the last webinar series. Uh, so while everyone is in the webinar, do you have any words uh, that you'd like to say? Yes. Um, where do I begin? Um, the thing about these webinars is that they really are a team effort. Um, over the last year and a half, we've had over 20 speakers contributing their time. Um, um, for that, we are really grateful. Um, but behind that, there's a whole team of people who, who make things happen, the sort of things that you don't see. The, the people who do the, the marketing, the people who do the website, um, the promotion, the people who, who make the technology work on the day. But everybody is essential to, to these, these events. So, you know, thank you to, to everybody. Um, I think you know who you are, but thank you. Um, and then, obviously, my, my compatriots on the day, um, you, Pavel, and uh, Tom, um, who's introduced many of our events. I, I can't even begin to express just you know, how amazing you guys are to work with. So thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, and of course, the, uh, the delegates, the other part of our triangle, um, you know, we've had, well, we've got many, many regular listeners. And, you know, I know some of you have been to a lot of our sessions and some of you have dipped in where, where appropriate according to your particular needs. Um, but the, the sort of really massive interest we, we've had in the training webinars really highlights the importance of, of the archiving. And, and that's really what motivates us. You know, reading your comments from the questionnaires and, and talking to some of you, it's been hugely instructive. Um, it's helping us shape where we're going. You probably won't realize this, but we really do look at the things you say. We create tables and graphs and we pour over them. So your input has been absolutely critical. So, you know, thank you for all of your support and for, for taking the time out of your B schedules to, to listen and to contribute. Um, yeah, and basically keep an eye on social media so you'll, you'll know what's, uh, what's coming next. But yeah, that, that's from me. So thank you to everybody. <clears throat> Tom, you're muted. Tom, you're muted. Oh, thanks, thanks, Pavel. I'm a bit out of practice. Um, no, I just also wanted to say a huge thanks to everyone behind the building block. This includes the policy leads in DG Connect and also the experts that we have coming from the ERC consortium. Um, Pavel, who's done a great job at organizing uh, so much of, of, of these webinars. And of course, for everyone who's, who's joined. So uh, I hope everyone will um, follow the relevant social media accounts. And when the day comes, we have more information about what is coming, how things are going to look in the future, how the building blocks, including e-archiving, will fit into the next uh, financing program. Uh, we hope that you'll all be with us as we start that exciting journey. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, you, you've been a linchpin for all these webinars. 
Um, so it, 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 you have been the perfect uh, partner in crime uh, when it comes to these. So, but we do have a couple of questions that have come in. So let's get back to the Q&A section. Uh, question number two, incorporating metadata in the form of a database into information packages may be common in other types of con content. Can you clarify how you have done this? And Kristen? Uh, yes, uh, that, that is correct. Uh, this is a, a user need uh, for a lot of uh, content types. Um, and at the Danish National Archive, the preservation format that we have right now for all kinds of digital data uh, is a format that is based on the SEAD format, that is the preservation format for databases. So in Denmark right now, you can't uh, submit data to the archive or, or put it on the um, preservation in the preservation storage without uh, creating an information package that always has uh, a database file which describe uh, the, the the documents that are in the information package and that is not only geospatial uh, files that is also other kinds of documents TIFF um, uh, Cal, CAD, uh, three-dimensional documents, whatever you put in the information uh, packets, you should always have a database file describing these documents so that we can actually uh, search for them in, in the information packets. And when preserving, we preserve um, electronic record management system as a databases too in the CR format. And often in these uh, IT systems, there are documents related to document registrations in the database so and there could be millions of documents so this is really important in, in those uh, content types uh, of um, IT systems so so that is how we do it right now and because we we are now uh, sh shifting from this Danish uh, version of preserving data, this specification that we have at the moment to using the EARC specification that splits it up into content types, we get this problem right now, how to combine it. And if we still have this need of uh, uh, information about the documents and the information package in the database format, how do we combine that with other content information type specifications and so on? Um, and the actual relation between the uh, the 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 document descriptions in the database and the actual documents in, in a folder in the information package, that is how we preserve it at the moment. Um, the relation there is um, described in the database in a column with a document ID that points to the name or the path of the folder where the, the actual document is. And that is actually this way of referencing uh, uh, external documents in the information package uh, from the CR file, from the database, the, the table information that is described in the constant information type for uh, uh, for CR, uh, which is also a specification from the EAC standard. So we have this way of preserving data is described in, in this specification. So we just need to be able to combine it in some way. Yes. And uh, Gregor, you would like to add something? Yes, uh, I would like to add that uh, in, in the idea of the package or in the whole idea of the SITS is to aim to have the interoperable solution for everyone. That's why we want to store the metadata in the standardized format for geospatial records in the case of geospatial records, of course. And uh, the database storage of metadata is just a secondary option to ease the process uh, because uh, databases may have their own data structures and people are not uh, aware of them, but structure, structures within the standardized uh, metadata, like uh, the Inspire metadata, is uh, known across Europe, so it enhances the reusability, findability. So uh, if we store uh, the database in a non-proprietary format, we should also aim to store a second representation that has a long-term standardized option. Yes, C could I uh, add uh, 
a comment to this, because of course the the the, the standardized metadata file is also important for us at the Danish National Archive, and we would probably do both. But what we ask ourselves all the time is, uh, um, at what level do you have you metadata? It is, are you describing the whole information package, and is that done in the, an Inspire? XML file metadata standard, you just describe the whole information package, or, you, or are you describing a data set in the information package, or are you describing a data file in the information package? There are metadata at so many levels, so you need to consider what are you actually describing, and where should you, you describe it, and where should you put it in the information package? And I think there's not one easy and one single answer to that question, but we need to consider that when creating information packages and metadata files. Well, that was very, uh, very comprehensive uh, to that question. Uh, so let's go on to the third question. And I think it's the final question that we have. Uh, on a related note, any thoughts of long-term preservation of uh, BIM and CAD? Has there been discussions of developing SITs for these formats? Uh, yes, I'll try to answer that. Uh, so we tried to broaden, I mean, uh, in this project uh, for the e-archiving building block, we added some additional uh, content uh, information type specifications like e-health. Uh, and we also aim to add additional engineering uh, elements. And, but we need to have inputs from people who want this and who want to contribute to the archiving building block. I think that this SITS Geospatial is a good start to actually create a spin-off of, uh, uh, to be specific for BIM or for CAD data or for other data, uh, because uh, they usually do not use the coordinate system component because they are on such a small scale. Um, but basically, they all uh, contain some type of uh, structure that can be defined uh, in a similar way. So we have a fun, uh, the foundation to actually go there. Uh, the question is only uh, what type of uh, directions will the uh, consortium, VR consortium be able to offer? Uh, so we would need some inputs from people who are knowledgeable about BIM or about uh, CAD data uh, and uh, what the European Commission will support. Thank you so much. Um, I'm checking the question and answer uh, page and I don't see any more. Um, We'll give uh, the people one more minute to write any other questions that they have. Uh, but I do have to give one last shout out to our behind the scenes uh, person, man, uh, Herbal, for which the streaming service and st uh, streaming wouldn't be possible. Uh, I do have to say thank you. He's been integral in the background of all of these. So, I see a thank you. So I think we have gone through all the questions and uh, it is sad to say that this is our last webinar, uh, but e-archiving will live on. These web uh, The webinar series will live on online. And uh, if you do wanna watch th uh, this webinar or any other webinars, we have provided the links in the, uh, in the chat uh, for you to peruse through our entire webinar series library with all the question and answers and the relevant links uh, for the webinars in the community pages and the webinar pages, uh, all of the webinar pages in that community space. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, so without further ado, any last thoughts? Uh, nope, I see. Okay, thank you all for joining. We did finish not only on time, but a little bit early. Uh, thank you all of you. And um, I, hope you, I hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as we enjoyed providing this webinar for you. And uh, this, uh, see you soon and thank you.